So, without further ado, we're going to, let's see, we're going to, uh, the order is going to be John Gilbert, Greg Byers, Paul Jacobson, and Buzz Feeton. So, let's begin with John Gilbert. If everybody got one of these, I, nobody had a chance to read it yet. So, what I'll do is I'll show you, in the words of one syllable, what this is all about. You have a fingerboard, like that. You have a 12 fret. What, what this system is, basically, we make a fingerboard for a longer basic string length than we want to use. And we cut off a 30 second, roughly, off the end of the fingerboard, thereby making the first fret closer to the end of the fingerboard than would be normal by around 28 thousandths of an inch and a second fret by a lesser amount and so forth until you get to the 12th fret which never changes places. It's always right where it always will be. And so what, and the 19th fret as you go this way, they start to get further towards the sound hole. So that normally where you say your 19th fret would be here, in, in the Gilbert would it be a little forward of that. Because you've used a longer string length. And when you cut this off, if you used, for instance, a, a uh, you wanted a 13 inch from here to the end of your fingerboard, like that, half of a 26 inch basic string length, you would make it for, you'd have to calculate it out, 13 and roughly a 30 second string length. And you'd calculate it, cut the fret slots, and you'd take the 30 second off the end. And you'd end up with 13 inches from here to here, times two, 26, basic string length. But what this eliminates partly and mostly is the, the flatting of your 19th fret, for instance. <clears throat> Many of you, I'm sure, if, uh, you've taken and hit the harmonic or listened to the 19th fret on many, many guitars, it'll sound flat. In fact, that's one of the things started me doing this, was this is, what, I think I started this in 1978, my first guitar, 79, somewhere in there. And I sat, I wasted a whole weekend on a, on a drawing board trying to figure out, I said, when you set the bridge back, you take your saddle, your bridge, you move it back, I don't know, in our case, 50 thousandths. Some people use 60, some more. That's fine for the 12th fret, I said to myself, well, what is it doing to the 19th fret? It's making it go flat. Because you have only one third of the string left between here and the saddle, and you've moved the saddle away, say, a sixteenth of an inch. That's a big increment. That's like three sixteenths on the overall scale length. So I said, there's got to be a better way. And so I still <coughs> sat and figured out the whole weekend, and finally, voila, this hit me. Make a bigger a fretboard for a larger string length, cut the end off, and you would have pushed the frets out. Because when you intone the first fret, as you intone it, you're stretching a good portion of the string, but there was no allowance made for that here, if you follow me. You follow me. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, basically, it's a real simple, uh, if you got, if you, those of you who got this sheet, Charlie will see that everybody else gets one. Would you, Charlie? You're going to write all the letters, Charlie, right? Mm. Huh? Well, what we're going to do is uh, have we'll some we'll, we'll pass them out tomorrow morning. Yeah. yeah. So basically, in our case, that's it. The way I arrived at Incidentia, I had uh, mo movable frets. I was making, uh, at the time, I was making uh, what they call the Sharma chord. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with that. You remember that? Yep. And so I made the first guitar with the Sharma chord, and I made it with removable fingerboards. It was 16 tones to the octave. And it was weird. And the guy, uh, he came up with this thought, he, so he said, well, I make him a guitar fingerboard, you know, with 16 tones of the octave, removable, so he could put a regular fingerboard on what he wanted. So I did, and he toured the United States, and finally they set up a factory somewhere in Iowa or something to, to build these, and I think some guy still makes a magnetic one with the Sharma chord type and mean temper and equal temper, and uh, it's still being done. But in any event, what I was, to, to prove his theory, I made up a fingerboard I was using very malleable uh, wire, 
And I was placing these frets to find out, was this guy a madman or will this actually work? And it worked. So I went to the same method of proving my, my theory out. I went to the <coughs> movable frets and uh, it worked. It still works. Well, Gilbert guitar since the 13th guitar on have this built into them. And I have done this to, I don't know how many other guitars for people. It's very simple. And the only difference on this saddle is the third string, we make the saddle, that's set back a little more, about 10, 15 thousandths, that's all. With, in our case, we use pins for a bridge, a saddle. We don't use a saddle, we use uh, pins. And I just break the third pin, so does my son. We just break it a little more. Simple as that. Guitars seem to play in two and have been played by a lot of people. We have no complaints. And uh, you'll be going, I think Greg has taken it a step further. But in any event, that's, that's the Gilbert method. Very, very plain, very simple. And if you get your, you get your uh, print out, it shows, it shows it in the back, the whole thing. Those of you who have them, that, that, that view there does it. God, I'm a good draftsman. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go, I had to give this little lecture back in uh, Burlington, Vermont. The, the night before we left, I was making this, <laughs> doing the drawing. But anyway, to, to make it more, to, clar to clarify, because the printout, as you read the printing, it's, it's uh, a lot of people have been, said they can't understand, they can't understand it. So I did, did that and it makes it more understandable. <coughs> now then, that, that sums up. I will say that the 12th fret never moves. The end of your fingerboard never moves. <coughs> and you read that, you'll see why. Nothing moves. In other words, if you wanted, if you wanted uh, uh, 12.850, for instance, or 800 from here to here, that's what you'll end up with. 12.800, the 12th fret's right where it always was, the end of the guitar. The neck is right where it always was. The saddle setback we use is 50 thousandths. There's a misprint in the, in the uh, catalog, LMI's catalog, in which it says John Gilbert's setback is something like a quarter of a millimeter. That was given to him by mistake. Somebody else gave it to him, not me. Because I haven't ever altered to 50 since I was a boy. <laughs> 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 Any questions on this? Hey, John. Yeah, what am I doing up here? Well, I'll tell you what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, yes. just, just to clarify, yeah. uh, we have uh, standard lead guitar next yes. to a Gilbert. Yes. And we, when we strike a, the, the same string on the 19th fret, right. standard guitar is going to be a little flat. Normally it will be slightly flat. The, and then if we do the same thing at the first fret, be, the standard guitar will be sharp. It's so sharp. little, you'll hardly, you'll hardly hear it. That's the other thing I want to point out. People say, is there a huge difference? No. There is not a huge difference. And let me, let me clarify a couple of things here. Uh, there are people who have tin ears. They can't hear. Uh, as an example, yesterday, a fellow picked up a guitar. I worked, worked on a guitar for this fr friend of mine. And uh, he said, oh, it's a beautiful guitar, and yeah, I love it, and that. So I put the scales on it. It was built with no setback at the saddle. It was, it was whatever, 13 from the end of the fingerboard to the center of the fret, and it was 13 to the forward edge of the saddle where the strings <coughs> came off. That's the way the guitar maker made it in Japan. And this guy's playing it, saying, it's great. What a beautiful guitar. He couldn't hear that. So I took the guitar and I did a few things on it. I said, boy, it sounds bad. I put the scales on it. I said, oh my God, there's no setback on the saddle whatsoever. So what I did is I took 35,000 off the back of his fingerboard, which made it something like a Gilbert guitar, and was able to milk enough out of the saddle that I got my 50,000 and the guitar played in tune. So he came to pick it up, and I'd gone over his frets and stuff, but he picked it up and he played it. And he said, God, it sounds great. We said that before, you know. So, that's that's you know some people that they they really they they can't hear. They I had a another incident. Maybe some of you heard me tell this one. This this retired school principal came to me and he said he he just for a visit. He said I got this nice guitar from Paracho. 
And he said, I went there and I picked this one out. He said, the reason I picked it out, the intonation is flawless on it. I said, really? And while he's telling me this, I'm looking at the guitar from around seven feet away, and I can see that the sixth fret is north. <laughs> a considerable amount. And I, so I'm watching him. So I, I have the old shop guitar, you know, that $7 special. I said, hey, play this. I want to see something. I took his guitar and put it down. The sixth fret was one hundred, one tenth of an inch. So help me God, a tenth of an inch. You could see it, you know. <laughs> and the guy's playing and saying that the intonation is flawless on this one. That's why I chose this one. <laughs> and I didn't have the, ch the heart to burst his bubble, you know. And uh, anyway, things like that happen. Or people get. You, you, they, I've seen guitars through the years that are horrible for intonation, and people are raving about how accurate it is and how it plays. So what we strive for in Gilbert guitars, of course, is to place the frets exactly where they should be. And we have fixtures and tools so that we place them. We generally can check, we do check as we're doing them. And if one of them, one, and this sounds like crazy to you, one day we had a slot go out five thousandths of an inch. And my son said, I think I screwed the board up. And I said, nobody will notice, you know, <laughs> in this particular fret. But I said, five thousand. That's, that's, we, we strive for like to keep it within three, usually two or one or zero. We try to put frets right where they belong. The fret wire is bad enough to start with. That's not that great, you know. So you don't need more errors built into the board. So we strive to get a very, very accurate board, 90 degrees <coughs> to the center line. We work everything to holes. And everything is, goes to make the guitar play in tune and easy. But definitely in tune. Now it's a very simple method and it works. Yes? Um, I'm having a little trouble understanding how the, you uh, you don't change that length to the 12th fret if after you saw off a little bit there. Doesn't that like cut it no. down? A no, you, you made the fingerboard larger yeah. and then you cut the end off. Now you make oh, it I a smaller. Gotcha. I gotcha. Yeah. You see? Yeah. So, so in other words, if you wanted as I said, if you wanted a 13 inch from the end of the fingerboard to the center line to the 12th fret, you would have made, in effect, a 16th oversized basic string length, and then cut it off. which means a 32nd more from the 12th fret, and cut it off. Okay. You don't really cut it off. You naturally, you machine the fret slots in where they should be, mm -hmm. allowing for that amount of setback. You, you, you know yeah. what I'm saying? You really never cut the end of the fingerboard off. In theory, you do, but in, in actual practice, all you would do is subtract everything and cut the fret slot where it should be. Yeah. But it will always be 13 inches then. But it's as if you had taken the board you built, cut it off, and then mount it. No, not, it's, not, it's not as though you took... If you built a board, say, for a 20... Say, it, use it 13 inches, so easy. You, would, you wouldn't make the basic string length, 26-inch basic string length, calculate a 17.815 or 81715, and go on and on and on, ad infinitum, so that you end up with a set of dimensions and you say, that's where the fret should be by a calculator or a computer, right? No. You would have taken the fingerboard a 16th inch bigger, a 16th inch bigger in basic string length, forget setback, basic string length, and you would have, you would have cut that fingerboard for that, over, that longer string length then cut the end off. Okay. By taking the 30 second off, you're right back to where you were originally, 13 inches. Okay. You would have made the basic string length 26 and a 16th. Yeah. Calculated on that basis, when you cut the end off, the 19th fret has moved that way and this less and less and less until like the, the, this fret I think is, or uh, what, a little over a thousandth of an inch out of place. Because as I say in a write-up, the, the setback for the 12th fret, it's fine for the 12th fret, and for the few frets on either side of it, the compensation is good. It's when you get further and further away that the compensation starts to kill you. So you compensate for the compensation. Yeah. That's, what you're doing. <laughs> That's basically what you're doing, yes. Setback is, is the same on the bass and the Oh, sure. Sides. Yeah. No different. Now, Greg's is different. I don't know what Paul's is or the other fellow, but uh, that that's, was good enough for me. It worked. It still works. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, I think you might have just answered this. So in other words, this affects the intonation down to the first and second fret. And the nineteenth fret as well. So in oh, other yeah. words, the classic if you play an open the first piece of the E chord and the G's in tune, 
And then you play a C Put, chord. Yeah, C, C chord, D chord, for instance. You can get them with, with this setup, at least in our guitars, they seem, they seem awfully good. And with a lot of guitars, you, you tune up for an E chord, you try to play C, uh, you don't want to do that. Right. <laughs> yeah? Um, I, I need to re-clarify. So what you're saying is that you are positioning, you're using a scale length, which is a... Sixteenth of an inch longer, longer basic string length, yes. So Calculate the fret for that. So now you're repositioning the first fret for a shorter uh, Yes, scale yes. The, the first fret basically has been moved down. Right. Okay? So the whole scale is moved down. Yes. Yeah. Right. yeah. It's, in, it's in this that Charlie's want to get everybody. Okay? But it shows it very, very graphically there. But that's what happens. It's the scale. It's like a rubber fingerboard. You went like that. Holding this one, don't let it move. And go like that. Yeah. John, do you have any feedback from people who've done this on steel string guitars? <laughs> Uh, I've had calls from different people. They say, what about a steel string? And I say, I don't, I don't know how much it would affect it because the steel string, especially electric guitar, the, the frets, the, the, the strings are so low that you don't get too much stretch. And a lot of people, some of them play almost fretless, you know. So if you vary the fret height, you have a different, there's a different setback. Uh, and if you lower the action, you'd need a different set, cut, you know, cut off point. So I don't know, Charlie. I really, I've never, I've never done it to an electric guitar, a steel string. I've had people say they're going to try it, and I, I never find out. I, they went out of business. I know that. I, but that's. <laughs> <laughs> I think Harry Fleischman might be the man who's correct. Could be. I, I've yes. Done, I've done several using your method on steel strings. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I found that the it's actually a little more than you need, like you suggested. Oh, yeah. I think that would make yeah. it a little less. But, yeah, it should. But, but I think if you're the fellow I talked to? No. No, I talked to somebody. I said, don't use that amount. You yeah, know, it's a little more that'd be a, way excessive. But it still sounds good. Yeah. And, but it sounds different. Yeah. And if you have, if you can hear well, you can hear the difference, yeah. but it sounds in tune. Yeah. And um, I don't know how else to put it. It's a very subtle difference. Yeah. Well, when I, when I mess with this, I, I used to, I was chief tool engineer for Hewlett Packard. And I took home, uh, we could take home instruments free, you know, just take them out of the shop. And I remember I had, I remember adding up once, I had, I don't know, that, oh, twenty or $30,000 worth of equipment on my bench. And when I did this, and, and I checked out, what did it do, electronically, what did it do to the sound? Was it still pure? And it was, like, I remember ch hitting the A, the fifth string, right on the money. I had a counter, it was one ten thousandth of a second. And it would show uh, any change in frequency whatsoever would show up, and it was they were right on the money, and I was quite I, I myself was amazed, you know that it, that it was that accurate. But getting back to electronic equipment and so forth, uh, you all know that, of course that you can't you can't really you can't really trust. Uh, okay, let me start another way. When you tune a piano, you tune middle C to middle C. And then as you progressively go down the bass side, you tune it lower. And you know that a, a semitone is broken into sons. One one hundredth of a semitone is one son. It looks like cent in English. Right? <laughs> son is one one hundredth of a semitone. OK? So wait, the way they tune a piano, they, I think it's, um, I learned this from a most brilliant man. He's an old piano. He owned a piano repair shop. And when I called him up, I wanted to buy one of his strobo tuners. He said, what do you want it for? I said, guitars. He said, it won't work. I said, why not? You know, sound, tone is a tone is a tone, you know? No, it isn't, he said. He said, if you have time, when I close my shop at 5 o'clock, I'll sit with you and we'll talk about this. And that was the most interesting man I ever talked to in my life about tone. I learned more about tone in two hours from that guy than I think I would have the rest of my life by myself because I'm a horrible teacher. But anyway, he said, no, that, that, I said, why is it that the strobo, tune, the strobo tuner is cursed by some, you know, piano repair man? He said, the reason is when you use a strobo tuner, which it was supposed to pick up and tell you that that is B, he said, when you leave middle C as you go south, bases, you're supposed to tune it down lower, like one or two sounds. One sound for the first fret, two for the second, I mean an octave, two for the second, third for the, th the third octave, and so forth. 
And the reason for that is what the bass strings are doing are picking up the treble strings. I got a few more minutes, Charlie? You're about there. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you took all my time. I <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm, I'm nice, though, aren't I? I'm, I smile when I say things like that. <laughs> anyway, so, so, so he said, they don't, they don't believe that. They say B is a B is a B, you know? And when you tune them from middle C north to trebles, you tune them you tune them down. I'm sorry, you tune them up uh, sharp. And the reason is they're picking up the bass sounds. And then you hit a chord, ten, 10 tones, boom. You say, that's perfect. The sound, oh, what a beautiful sound. There isn't a note there that's pure. <laughs> there isn't, believe me, there isn't one note that if you checked it electronically is absolutely pure. But they sound pure. I remember say, telling a friend of mine this, he said, I wonder if that's what happened to this guy who tuned the piano. He said, I just have my piano tuned. It sounds worse than before he showed up. You know, and he had an instrument, and it sounds horrible, you know? Could be one of the guys that was cursing the instrument, saying that bunch of crap about, you know, these red lights moving around. I don't need red lights. I use a gauge. You know? So anyway, that's why when I was checking guitars for tune, tuning, I was constantly getting overtones. You'd get... 220, 440, 880, 1760 would show up constantly. Once I got one undertone. A guitar does not want to produce undertones, it produces overtones and highs. And that's what your ear hears. You see? So there's another method for your madness in doing this. And the other compensation is stretch and stretch. It works. Yeah. If you do this as a retrofit on an existing guitar, you would shorten the nut end. Does that also mean you bring the compensation of the bridge inwards? It's according to whether if it was perfect to start with. You know, in other words, you had 13 and 13 and say a 16th. You know, if you move this, you got a 30 second. You got to move that at 30 second. You see? Okay. But what happened, like in this guitar yesterday, when I worked on it, it was ideal. There was no setback, so I could take, cut off the end. That helps me, and then move the saddle a little bit. That that finished it. It puts it right where you want it, you see? It's according to where the string demarcation is off the saddle, whether you have anything to work with. I had no room to put move the saddle slot, as an example. The strings come off the tie bar almost straight, like that, as it was, you know? So you couldn't, you couldn't do anything about moving it in any closer. You'd be the other side of the tie bar, mm -hmm. the way the guy built it. Yes? Uh, your thoughts on uh, normal tension versus hard tension versus Brand the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, I prefer my own feel. I don't play very well. <laughs> my son would say, come on, Dad. Well, you don't even play, you know? <laughs> and I prefer extra hard tension. I like the feel of them for as badly as I play. I like the, the surety, the sureness of the feel when I grip the strings. Then I can hang, you know? <laughs> Stuff like that. But I like that feel. Uh, David Russell plays, uh, he's had Gilberts for, he's had about 11 Gilberts, I guess. And he prefers normal tension. When you hear him play, he's playing normal tension strings on a Gilbert. He likes that sound. He, he prefers the thin string. He said, I like the tone, I like the feel. So that's all he plays on his, on his uh, guitars, normal tension strings. And you don't find any difference in the, in the corrections that you do for instance? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You meant in re re relation to that? Yeah. Not really. It seems to work on everything, at least in nylon string guitars. There isn't that much difference between normal and extra hard. Between hard and extra hard, I think you're talking about two, two and a half pounds, something, three pounds. So that's about it. Hey, John. Yeah. Would you, uh, would you place your pins differently if you knew you were making a guitar for a low tension string person versus an extra hard? If I were going to lower the action. Then I would put the, I'd want to, instead of 40,006, for instance, a flamenco guitar, you, if you're going to have it real low, you, 60 thousandths of an inch is getting to be a little excessive. And you want to hear a little bit of flatting take place. So you want to move, the, move that forward in a flamenco. You have to make that allowance. Absolutely. But not on a classical hard, uh, hard tension. Hard versus, versus normal. Mm, not really. Not really. You, if, you, if you want to design it for one and make it for that, you could, but there's so little difference that. Significant. Our next speaker will be Greg Beyer. Thank you. 
getting a little, a little hot in here, a little warm in here after. Put that off your shirt, John. <laughs> <laughs> um, John told me about his method of uh, setting intonation years ago, and I uh, played around with it, and and uh, I, I never quite understood his logic behind it, but I mean, you know, it works for him. And it worked pretty darn well for me as well, but I had questions about it, and I started wondering what's behind it, what's the basis for it. So then I ran into a, um, a paper published in Journal of Guitar Acoustics years ago by uh, Bill and Pat Bartolini that talked about the theoretical basis that would provide more or less an explanation for what John was doing that, that I could relate to a little bit better. And uh, at any rate, based on their work, I went ahead over the years and developed a, a mathematical model um, for intonation, which uh, is presented pretty much in the handout that you may have or may have not have gotten. There are more at the door, I believe, um, that was published in American Lutheran last year. And uh, I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, it's it was an interesting exercise, and, and I learned a lot from it, but it's not really essential to understand the mathematics behind this to, uh, to get good intonation on your guitars. <laughs> Basically, I, the, the mathematical model uh, dealt with um, two aspects of intonation. It dealt with elasticity and inharmonic inharmonicity of strings, and those are uh, 25 cent words for, for uh, uh, stretch and uh, stiffness, which are nickel words, I guess, by that uh, accounting. But at any rate, um, at the end, toward the end of that paper, I discussed an empirical method for establishing ideal f uh, fret placement. And basically, what that uh, amounted to was I had a, I made a little device which I used for another aspect of the modeling, um, which essentially allowed me to vary the uh, string length, the distance between nut and saddle positions with wing nuts here. It's just very simple. I used to have Gilbert individual tuners on here, but I sold them. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, you can vary the height of the saddle. And what I originally did is I made a little section of fretboard with only five frets on it. Uh, this was sort of in pre preparation for my talk uh, at the uh, Guild Convention a couple of years ago. And uh, I was too cheap and too lazy to, to waste a whole fingerboard. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, what I did was I set the distance as accurately as I could uh, at a nominal uh, string length in, in that, you know, 650, let's say. And, um, and then with this little device, I set the, uh, I slid this underneath the strings and moved it around and uh, depressed the string and sounded it. And I moved it around and I used it a little electronic uh, tuning, tuner device. And when I got the 12th fret, uh, in tune, I made a measurement. What's the distance between that 12th fret and the uh, either end, really, because I knew what the total length was. And then I would uh, go for the 5th fret, or 7th fret, I guess I had here, and 3rd fret, and the 1st fret, 17th fret. I'd get a set of data points for each string. And then I uh, did a little regression analysis, and this, this is where the math came in uh, with this empirical method. And you don't really have to understand why I had to do that exactly, but I'll, I'll go through it real quickly. Basically, what I wanted to do for a, for a fixed nominal scale length, you can move a, your little fretboard, and, and in fact, ideally, you could use a whole fretboard and move it back and forth, and that's pretty much what I did here. I've got a wing nut and a little track it runs on so that I can it's much easier to measure that way. Keeping a fixed uh, distance between nut and saddle, you can move a sk your fingerboard back and forth and get each one of these things as closely in tune as you can. 
make measurements of what those distances are, run a regression analysis on them, and you can find out what uh, the optimal uh, scale length ought to be for those frets, given this uh, uh, actual distance between nut and saddle. And then the object was to try to find a way to you, and for each string it's going to be different. You're going to have a different optimal scale length um, from which you would calculate your fret placement. And you have to scale them, uh, all of the strings to a, some common factor in order for you to use fret wire that works across the board for all six strings. Basically, that's what I did, and it's described in this paper. Um, but there's a much simpler way to go about this as luthiers and use a device such as this uh, to find out what uh, uh, optimal fret placement ought to be on any guitar. And you, it doesn't matter if it's nylon strings, like I've got here, or steel strings. In fact, if there's time uh, during the festival, if anybody wants to put some steel strings on here, we can make some measurements. What I did in, in, described in there was to hold the distance between nut and saddle fixed. But what makes a lot more sense to us as luthiers, and is a lot easier to do, although it's perhaps not quite as accurate, is to make the uh, setting of the frets fixed. This, is, this board was cut to a 640 millimeter uh, nominal scale length and vary the position of the nut and the saddle. So what we can do then is to set this fingerboard. We can do exactly what John does. We can um, move the uh, nut you know, a sixteenth of an inch closer to this first fret if we want, and then we can set the, uh, the, whole, the whole mechanism closer to the, or farther away from the, the uh, uh, saddle here. Yeah. Yeah, Greg, uh, just, so, just so I understand, uh, the relationship between from one fret to the next on your board still uses the typical yeah, mathematical slope root of two? Uh, that's so right. Just like John's done. That's right. This is, the idea is to be able to set your frets according to the standard uh, mathematical relationship that we all work with. And, uh, but just to allow the nut and saddle positions to vary. And in, so in other words, you're coming up with kind of an individualized uh, string length for each string. That's correct. Uh, individualized string length because the, once we allow the nut and saddle to vary in position, the distance between them can vary in position as well. So it's not just moving the board somewhere between two fixed points. It's um, moving the nut position relative to the fingerboard and moving the saddle position relative to the fingerboard. And for each string, it's going to be different, uh, slightly different, depending on the, the physical properties of the string and, and how high the saddle is above your fretboard. And um, so once you've got the, that information, so, so once you get it set, and the idea is to get it set so that uh, when you play, in, play, let's say, at the 12th fret, you're in tune. When you play on the 1st fret, you're in tune. When you play at the 19th fret, you're in tune. And every fret in between. Um, it turns out that because when you, when you stretch the string and pressing the fret, and be, because of the other inharmonicity properties of the string, the thickness and the mass and so on, um, uh, the uh, ideal fret placement is not going to precisely coincide with this mathematical formula by which we set the frets. But it's very, very close. And it's very, uh, I don't think we can, I mean, 99% of us can't uh, distinguish in our orally uh, a difference. And in fact, none of the fret placements uh, vary from, from the, the mathematical relationship that we normally cut frets by. None of the ideal placements really uh, vary more than I would say a tenth of a millimeter. Uh, from that, even though we we when we press the when we fret a note, we do have uh, automatically are taking into consideration all these other factors like uh, inharmonicity and uh, and uh, elasticity of the string. So um, so what that what you end up with then is a, is a measurement, basically two measurements. When you've got your fretboard and your nut and your saddle positioned so that everything plays in tune. Then you can just measure uh, the distance from the saddle to the saddle to the 12th fret, and um, 
subtract your nominal string length from that. In this case, it's 640. If, you, if the distance here is 320, one and a half, then your saddle setback for that string should be one and a half millimeters. And then if you measure uh, nominally for a 640 scale length, the distance between the nut and the first fret should be, um, I think it's 35.9 uh, millimeters. If it ends up being 35.1 millimeters, that means you have to set your nut forward eight tenths of a millimeter for that string. And for each string, it's a little bit different. The figures that I published in this article uh, when you try them out with this setup um, are still pretty darn good. They're pretty close. Uh, as I said, I, I derived those... <laughs> I derived those with this little thing and doing a regression analysis. a different method, really, but um, uh, in any event, what, what John said about uh, stretch tuning in pianos does complicate matters, because if you do use a, an electronic tuner to precisely set where you, these frets should be placed, um, it probably isn't going to give you exactly what your ear hears. And unfortunately, it's not quite as simple as with the piano, because with the piano, the higher notes are fixed strings. They're not fretted. And they, the properties of those fixed strings are different. Um, uh, we, we take a, a string that's designed for a long, uh, a long scale length and a low note, and we fret it up high, and it's going to um, uh, create more, different kinds of complications than you have on the piano. And I don't know what the answer is with regard to that, but if you do use a tuner, an electronic tuner, to, to, to uh, set your, you know, to de determine your nut and saddle placements, uh, it actually works quite well. And, um, and you'll find that you can play those chords down in first position um, and they'll be in tune, you know, given the fact that you're talking about, we're talking about equal temperament. And uh, um, so that's pretty much it. It's something that we all, you know, anybody can make in their shop. It doesn't have to be, you know, I mean, I'm sure you could even make a guitar with cutting the board short and make a, a nut with movable you know, just a movable position, individual positions for the nut and for the saddle, and work it out for yourself, what works on your guitar, with your strings, with your action, and so on. Yes? Uh, do you find any difference with the uh, new smaller diameter third strings, you know, like the uh, Salvarez Alliance? Uh, the Salvarez Alliance don't seem to require quite as much setback uh, at the saddle, and possibly not quite as much set forth at the nut, but I, I haven't really done a very careful analysis of that. And uh, I did, just the other day, uh, have a guitar uh, in my shop that had one of these new uh, uh, G-string, uh, strange composites that Daddario's putting out for their G-strings, and that's a much stiffer string. It's, it's uh, narrow in diameter, but it's very stiff, and it seemed to require more setback. Stiffer than a light on the alliance? Yeah, it's a very stiff string. Well, I don't know if it's stiff in the aliens. Yes? Once you have the note established, the placement, you said you measure it to the nut or to the saddle. How do you measure it? Uh, that's, that's a good, good point. Um, his question was, how do you actually measure this distance to, let's say, the 12th fret to the saddle or, or to the nut? Um, I don't have a good method, frankly. I have a steel rule that's uh, divided into uh, uh, half millimeter increments. I put a little uh, clip-on thing to my glasses so it magnifies it three times or something like that. And I interpolate between lines on the ruler. And, um, you know, an engineer could rig up something that would be much more accurate than that, but uh, that's what I did. And uh, what I find is, is that I can't with my hearing at least, I can't distinguish differences less than about a tenth of a millimeter. Furthermore, I can't make a fingerboard or, or a setup with differences, uh, you know, to have control over distances much less than a tenth of a millimeter. Uh, so that's sort of the, the uh, degree of accuracy that I'm kind of working with. Yes. Yeah, the compensated nut concept. Why don't more people do it? Well, I, my theory is that uh, nobody has had a, or thought about a good means of testing 
how to do it and what the best way to do it is. And it hasn't been obvious until fairly recently that you need to even move the nut forward. Um, What's the difference between compensating the nut and compensating the saddle? That there would be a difference. Well, because when we, people, uh, I think, because as we go up a fretboard, we see obviously that the note's getting sharper. Okay, we got to move the saddle back. Whereas down here, oh, we're a little bit out of tune. Well, I don't know why. We just are. It's just the way guitars are. <laughs> Isn't that it? <laughs> um, for people who are a little nervous about cutting it off uh -huh. into the fingerboard, um, don't be. You can just well, you can also just stick little little wedges in. Yeah, you could sure. You can make an overhanging an overhanging uh, sa uh, nut if you nut, want. Yeah, but you can just you can find that very quickly. That's right. That moving forward helps. Yeah. If you can hear the difference. Well, so so here's the other thing. I the the test I use is is a pretty severe test, but it's really the one that we all should be working toward, and that is to get the unisons and octaves in tune all up and down your fingerboard, including the open strings. And you should try that on one of your guitars and see if it if it indeed is in tune. Um, and it's probably not. And even in my guitars, it's there. You know, strings vary. Um, the tension and the way that you fret the note can vary, especially up high. So you're never going to find perfection, but that's, that's what you should be seeking. You should be seeking to get those uh, octaves and unisons in tune. I mean, that's, that's a test of the, the, that everything else is in tune. And if you find consistently that in particular positions you're not getting that, then something's wrong with your intonation and the way it's set up. Great. Would I uh, be close to being correct if I thought that uh, the setback from the saddle had more to do with the string stretch or elasticity and that the nut uh, compensation had more to do with the stiffness of the string? It's actually just the opposite of that. Oh, really? Yeah. If you look in the, in the paper, the, the, the handout, um, the theoretical part, uh, the, what basically, I'll, I'll tell you a simple explanation. When you play, when you play an open fret, um, it's the only time that you're not stretching the string by fretting it when you, when you play an open string. So if you tune to, let's say, uh, this is a, a, a G string, you tune to G on this string, and you fret any, any note, you're stretching that string. So you're raising the pitch of that string. So as a, as a sort of a quick and dirty explanation for why you need to move the nut forward, think of it in terms of that. You're stretching that string every time you're fretting it. So you have to compensate for the fact that you're not stretching it when it's, uh, when it's uh, played open. That's why you have to move that nut forward, in a, in a, in a nutshell, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. Um, what about size of fret water itself? How, how that well, uh, I don't know about steel string players. Glasgow players generally don't go all the way down to the board when they fret, unless they're really having trouble with a chord or something like that. So, um, and in fact, uh, on the other hand, your finger touches the board usually a little bit. I, I, I tried putting really high fret wire on a guitar once for a guy, um, and he was disoriented because his fingers weren't touching the board. It wasn't the fact that he was getting the strings to the board before that. What about width? I mean, you're shortening, if you've got a wide, if you have a wide fret wire, aren't you actually? Yeah, yeah, that's another thing with fret wire. It, you should never flatten the top of your frets in order to, in order to, you know, get a flat board. You really should keep them as crowned. In fact, use narrower wire than I, I don't understand with the steel string players. I guess it's a lot easier to play if you've got really wide frets, but it's going to be a lot harder to keep it in tune. I think. Yeah. Yeah. You said basically that there is an optimum nut and saddle position for each string, which isn't necessarily the same point. That's uh, that's correct. It's going to. So, now the saddle normally on a guitar is angled, so it compensates for that. Are you saying that maybe the nut should be angled as well? No, I'm saying that you should set each uh, set the the saddle and nut individually for each string, so that you have a facet, let's say, um, going farther back from the E to the G in a classical guitar, and all the way, I guess, with to the D in the. No, how does it work? You have four <laughs> four wound strings in the steel string. You might. It probably. What I do is, if this is the saddle, looking down on it, 
Um, the, uh, I arrange it so that the first uh, string <coughs> breakpoint, if, if this is the nut end down here, the, the breakpoint is right at the leading edge of the saddle, and then it's set back a little bit for the uh, B string, and it's set back quite a ways for the uh, G string, and then it's just set back a little bit for the D, a little bit more for the A, and a little bit more for the E. It kind of looks like that. This can be a little bit different uh, in a steel string. And at the nut, the G string, the leading edge is at the um, break is the break point for the G string, and that's where you you if this if this is the first fret. I, I don't know how easy it is for you people to see. Off? Pardon me. Doesn't, that doesn't throw your 12th fret off as far as the mid point well, of the string. Um, it doesn't. This isn't John's lecture. This is this is a different method. Okay. <laughs> uh, the the 12th tw fret. All right. Here's the 12th fret. What we're doing. Each string has. Um, a different optimal optimum nut position, a different optimum saddle position. And it's going to be different for each string. The idea is to use the same fingerboard for all the strings. So what's going to vary is the nut and saddle positions. The fingerboard is fixed. But that actual, the length is going to vary between nut and saddle for each string, and the actual positions are going to vary. And it turns out, I, I don't mean to... to uh, I mean, John's system works quite well, and, and in fact, it's not that different. It doesn't end up being that different than this one. Uh. Um, but what I uh, understand is that even if you were to uh, displace the uh, saddle, you know, for each string, it would wind up being less than a tenth of a millimeter anyway uh, if you wanted to be that accurate. Is that correct? I mean, we're talking about adjustments that fine? Uh, uh, no, I'm talking actually, I move my third string uh, back almost three millimeters relative to the to the E string. Yeah, oh, so did, so did John. Uh, no. But uh, the other ones? Uh... Well, this goes back over two millimeters. The, does it? Yeah, so we're talking a range of three millimeters for the saddle. We're talking a range of uh, one millimeter okay. for the nut. R roughly speaking. Now, does your, does your nut compensation go out the window if you play with the capo? Uh, uh, <laughs> not exactly, um, because what you, uh, I mean, it's already been out the window if you don't have the compensation, right? And what you're doing when you play, put a capo on is you're fretting the string. So you're take, your compensation is allowing you to put a capo on and be in tune. With the, when you put the capo on, you're still, uh, those open strings should still be in tune. You're, f you're stretching them again when you play the chords, so you might get yourself out of tune a little bit just by stretching it twice. But uh, no, it's actually better with the capo than, with, uh, with, uh, than without compensation. Yeah. Effectively, I just realized I'm saying that, then the, the compensation of the nut compensates only really for the open strings, whereas the saddle is a combination of the open strings plus the fretted strings. That's now, more or less true. Now more like or less. Doing a grand bar or anything else, it's going to be in tune there because the saddle is taking care of that part. It's really the open strings here that the nut is. Um, that's Greg, that's more or less true. Can you the uh, yeah, I'm sorry. The, your your point was that um, the nut compensation uh, accommodates uh, compensates for the open string, whereas the saddle compensation compensates for all the fretted notes. And the open notes. And, so yeah, and the open notes. Well. Yeah, and that's more or less true. I mean, I say more or less because, unfortunately, everything's more complicated <laughs> if we look into it, you know, closer. But that's, that's pretty good. Yeah. Well, Greg, there's a company back in the 1960s that made electric guitars called Microfress, and they had a nut that was adjustable in each string. That company is no longer in business. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what they did. Well, the public may not be interested, but if, but um, my contention is, um, I mean, there are players out there who fr are frustrated with tuning their guitars, and there are makers out there who are frustrated with tuning their guitars. And there are people who collect microfrets guitars. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, do we have any questions? Yeah. Back to the room. Uh, what can you suggest for guitar players who 
guitar players would like to change their tunings a lot? Um, it Why shouldn't. Pardon me? Find more guitar. There, <laughs> there you go. Uh, it shouldn't make a heck of a lot of difference. Uh, if you tune down, uh, tune, let's say you tune down uh, a whole step or even more, uh, the properties of the string are going to change a little bit. It's not as under as much tension. But uh, I don't think that it's going to create too much. I don't think it's going to create a serious problem. Yeah, yeah. To follow up on this gentleman's question about the nut compensation, if you're building an instrument for a jazz player who might never or rarely play open strings, would you still find there's an advantage in compensating it for that? Oh, sure, because, uh, I mean, he's, there's going to be open strings played, and, and even if it's only rarely, you don't want it to stand out. Yeah. And, and furthermore, I should say that if you don't compensate, you still, you still, um, no, I'll take that back. I'll just leave it as, as it was. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just as a quick overview, what I'm thinking is uh, basically what we're dealing with here is band-aid approaches to the fact that we're using tempered tuning in which the major thirds are sharp by as much as 13% of a semitone, mm -hmm. from what I understand. I was involved with two but, systems. But wait a minute, let me, let me say one thing. We're, this isn't a band-aid approach because of that. What we're trying to do is actually achieve that. We're not achieving, well, as guitar builders, we're not achieving tempered tuning. We're dealing with the a band-aid approach to the mechanics of, of depressing a string. Yeah. The two systems that I, I worked with, two companies I subcontracted with that actually solved it, was Zeta Systems with the fret scanning uh, Mirror 6 MIDI guitar, in which they could move the fret spacing electronically and play in just intonation in all 12 keys. Oh, that's Another cool. one was this guy named Mark Rankin that, um, that uh, Gilbert referred to. And if anyone's into, if you've ever seen a just intonation fingerboard, like the uh, magnetic ones, the frets are radically skewed and staggered. Right. That's the only way to really deal with it. Um, I do have information. I should have brought it and copied it, mm -hmm. copies of that. And I can put anyone in touch who really wants to do that kind of more radical building. Right. Well, the thing about that, uh, this electronic uh, method sounds pretty neat. But if you want to play in just intonation, which is not, uh, you know, uh, pianos are, are equal tempered. Uh, they're not in just intonation. Um, uh, guitars, because of the mechanics of the fingerboard, are attempt to be in just, in equal temperament. And what we're attempting to do, what I'm attempting to do, is to get a guitar to play in equal temperament instead of some something else. So, um, but if you want to do just intonation, I've heard a recording of a guitar um, that had this kind of a fingerboard on it, and the thing was playing out of tune. I mean, he was he was playing. Uh, there were octaves that were just way off. And so I, I'm skeptical of that. But we will produce um, fingerboard charts for whatever scales you want, whether it's 12 note scales yeah. or whatever. I did play a banjo in just intonation. It was one of the most beautiful things I've yeah. ever heard. The fewer strings you have, the better off. <laughs> 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 All right. So, um, OK, well, I guess that's it then. So anyway, any steel string people out there who want to play with this, during this week, we need a quiet room, but uh, to hear it. But it, you know, you're welcome you to. Tapped into the travel guitar market. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>